All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Joshua Von Dresik. I am the Flight Systems uh, sub-team lead for the Demos team. And my name is Jonathan Stucker. I'm the ground station control lead for the Demos team. All right. Um, so we're just going to do a general overview of just basic avionics systems and what you can really expect when it comes to being a part of an avionics sub team. All right. So um, I'm the sub team lead for flight systems, which is just kind of a fancier sounding way of saying avionics. Um, now, what are avionics exactly? Um, well, the avionics are essentially the brains of the rocket. This is what does all the processing, all the data allocation. Um, it's what the sensors themselves are actually a part of. Um, if you're planning on doing a payload or a parachute or anything related to electronics, that essentially falls into the category of avionics. Um, <laughs> now, people tend to overlook avionics as an important part of a build. Um, just because, you know, when you think rockets, you think structures building these massive rocket bodies and all these fancy tubes to ensure that all the, the gases or the, the solid propellant is held properly. Um, or you think of the propellant itself, you know, planning um, propulsions and actually doing the math to figure out how high the rocket's going to go and all that. Um, but avionics is an incredibly crucial part of any major rocket. Um, because you know, without a parachute system, how are you going to recover any of the rocket body or anything really? Um, now, when you're a part of a, a major collegiate team like we are, obviously you don't want to send probably about three thousand dollars worth of hardware up into the sky just to watch it crash straight back into the ground. Um, so yeah, don't don't listen to anybody that says, "Hey, avionics isn't that cool" or "avionics isn't that important." Um, so this is an example of what an avionic system would actually look like. Um, this is something that John and I actually built ourselves last year. Uh, we're both sophomores right now, and we essentially came into college with little to no knowledge of how to do any of this. Um, I know I had a little bit of coding background, and I think John may have had just a little bit as well. Um, but we never really worked with sensors or hardware, and this is all very new to us. Um, so as you can see on here, we have a few major components and stuff. Um, we'll kind of break down uh, each component into a smaller subsystem just so we can get a sense of what exactly everything on this board does and how we came around to figuring out that's what we actually need to use. <laughs> kind of cool looking too. Um, but what does it actually do? So arguably the most important part, or one of the most important parts of our avionic system is called the microcontroller. Um, now you're going to find one of these in most major rocket launches that is working with data. Um, if you need anything beyond just an altimeter, which just measures how high the rocket is in the air, um, you're going to want one of these to, one, wire everything to, and two, actually process the data. Um, and you can either save it to uh, the microcontroller itself, or you can transmit it, um, which I'll get, I'll get into in a little bit. Excuse me. Um, so for our personal team, uh, we use something called the BeagleBone Black. Now the BeagleBone Black is <laughs> essentially if an Arduino and a Raspberry Pi had a baby. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with either of those, those are two other very popular microcontrollers. Um, they're used in all kinds of projects and all kinds of, you know, DIY, uh, build something cool. <laughs> um, now, the BeagleBone itself is essentially just a small computer. Um, it has RAM, it has a processor, um, it has its own storage. Well, I guess it doesn't have its own storage. It has a, a little uh, micro SD card that you actually insert as like the, the flash storage. Um, but it can do more or less anything that just a regular computer can do. Um, just obviously not as powerful, given that these are, you know, 30 to 40 bucks and have like a half gigabyte of RAM. Um, but when all you're doing is just recording data, it's absolutely perfect. Um, yeah, again, this is it. 
essentially what we plug everything into just to make sure it actually works. Um, so just as an example, you can see on the right side of this PCB, um, you can see all those wires and connections and stuff. That is basically being plugged straight into Lego Vault Black. So moving on, um, the first major sensor uh, that we're going to look at right now is something called the IMU, or the Inertial Motion Unit. This, as <laughs> the text says, is essentially a glorified accelerometer. Um, it can read acceleration in six degrees of freedom, which means it can do tilt, both directions, it can rotate, um, it can do translation, so all of your major axes into the screen, um, and it'll output just the, the accelerations it's reading. Now this is incredibly useful when um, recovering a rocket and trying to figure out things like how fast it was actually going. Um, if you can plot the data you've collected from the accelerometer over time, you can actually derive things like uh, maximum velocity, uh, just maximum speed in a particular direction. Um, there's a lot of different stuff you can do with it. Um, now this is called, or this specific um, piece of hardware that we have is called the BNO 055. Um, it comes with a, a couple of other special features, excuse me, um, including a magnetometer, which measures um, the Earth's magnetic field, um, has a built-in gyroscope and everything, which kind of goes into the whole reading acceleration portion of it. Um, and it has a couple other lesser known, lesser used uh, readings it can do as well. So <laughs> one of the most crucial sensors that you need in absolutely every rocket it's called the barometer, um, or also referred to as an altimeter. Now, essentially what this does is it measures the ambient air pressure. Um, so you can basically insert the, the air pressure at ground level, and it'll constantly compare the air pressure that it's currently at as it's traveling upwards um, to the ground level. So by or through the difference of the two readings, um, you can essentially just uh, figure out how high you are relative to the ground. Um, now, when it comes to rocketry, obviously that's kind of everything you needed to do. If you don't know where you are relative to the ground, you have no way of telling when to deploy your parachute. And then we run back into the problem we kind of touched on before about how you don't want $3,000 slamming into the ground at you know 90 meters per second. Um, so, Typically, an altimeter will be the primary means of reading the height um, aboard the rocket. You typically won't find something like an altimeter on other sensors, so you absolutely need to make sure you have either an altimeter or um, something called a strata logger, which I'll get into, which is just an altimeter, but kind of an all-in-one unit. Um, very important. Make sure you have one. Um, and now the last of our sensors that we used, at least on ours, is called multiplexer. The multiplexer is a bit more advanced piece of hardware. It's not quite as plug and play as it is with the other two. Um, now essentially what it does is it takes the data outputs from multiple sensors, um, up to eight actually, and it all it condenses all of them down into one single signal. Um, now this signal comes from the multiplexer straight into the beagle bone. Um, now it makes wiring infinitely easier because you don't have to take the outputs of every single sensor you're using and individually wire them into the beagle bone black. Um, you just simply connect them to the multiplexer, um, add a little bit of code, and voila, you've just added a new sensor to your system. Um, Oops. So something that we've been recently trying to do that's quite a bit more complex than just your average avionics system is communication. Um, now, we were graciously donated um, several ZoomLink 900 series uh, radios uh, a number of years ago. Now, these are very expensive pieces of hardware that range $500 to $600. Um, now, essentially, it's just a military-grade radio that we can program to send signals um, from one radio module to the other. Um, and since it's military grade, it's rated to over 60 miles, which is just about to the Kármán line, <laughs> which is the, the globally accepted 
edge of space. <laughs> um, so we've been recently trying to integrate this into our system. Um, and essentially all it does is it gets connected to our Beaklebone Black, which is already you know, being sent all the data from our sensors. And we're sending it from the Beaklebone Black to the radio module. And then the radio module will be traveling up in the rocket. And we have a separate one down at a ground station. And um, we're essentially just sending that data from one to the other, which doesn't sound that exciting or that important. But to have a live feed of data from a rocket, uh, it, it's very useful <laughs> when it comes to some other stuff we'll get into in a later presentation, like predictive uh, landing software. Now, just as a, a general sense of what you need to do um, chronologically when working on an avionic system, um, I wanted to make this kind of six easy steps, six easy steps to um, being on avionics. So the first thing you always want to do um, when first starting to plan for a rocket is figure out what your problem statement is, figure out what um, the constraints and what data and everything you need. Um, just research everything about the project or the goal you've been given to do. Um, making sure you know what's actually feasible as well before actually starting work on a project is very useful in cutting out a lot of wasted time. Um, so once you have a good sense of what your goal is, you can start going about and figuring out what data you'll need to reach that goal. Now, if it's like a, for example, if it's just a simple height goal, um, you know all you really need is an altimeter because that can read all of the, or the, the height values over time. Um, and really making sure you have all the data you need uh, to accomplish your four set goal <laughs> is going to make um, the rest of the process easy as well. You don't waste time, you know, uh, playing around with sensors and things you don't actually need. Uh, which brings me to number three, uh, selecting your sensors. Once you know what data types you need, um, you can go out to pretty much any electronics store online that works with microprocessors and sensors and just simply read through the description of each sensor and just say, is this outputting the data I actually need? Um, do we need to know the, the acceleration in a particular direction? Maybe we need um, an IMU. Once you have all of your sensors selected and you actually have them bought, you can begin prototyping. Um, prototyping is one of the most important steps, I would say, when it comes to actually physically constructing the system. Um, it's all well and fine to plan ahead, um, but when it comes to actually wiring things together and making sure you don't have too high a voltage or something's not shorting out, prototyping is absolutely essential for that real world kind of perspective. Um, now basically you can just get something called a breadboard, which is like a little test board you can plug wires into as well as your sensors um, and just start to test your individual sensors, making sure they work and also mapping the circuits between both your sensors and uh, the microprocessor. Once you have everything mapped out, it becomes infinitely easier to hardwire a PCB um, like the one we showed you before. So I know it's kind of hard to see, but we have all these individual lines and stuff. Um, we figured out all of those and what needs to be connected to what well before we ever tried to make something like this. Um, once we know it's working, then we can make it flight ready, as it were, to make sure it won't come apart during the, the middle of the launch because the rocket shakes too much. Um, finally, once you have it built, you just integrate it into your rocket. Um, most systems will have something called an avionics bay, which and this just kind of slides into or is fastened into, um, and you should be ready for launch. Um, and just in the event that you're just doing a simple parachute deployment, you don't need any fancy data or anything. You just need something to make the rocket go up once it comes down to a certain height just to deploy the parachute. Um, this is something we've used in the club for a number of years called the strata logger. Basically all it is is just an altimeter. You can plug wires in in a specific way to set heights. Um, I believe the, the main two ones are deploying the parachute at 750 feet or deploying the parachute at Apogee, or the, the top of the rocket's flight. 
Um, it just automatically sets it up once sets it off once it hits that height threshold. All right. Um, so that's kind of a general overview of the flight system specifically and kind of the avionics. Um, now to actually apply everything, I'll hand it off to Jonathan. All right. Thanks, Josh. That was that was kind of epic. Uh, so now I'm going to talk, uh, take a little bit of time to talk about some of the applications and where you would want to use some of these uh, different sensors and just the hardware in general that Josh was talking about. Uh, <clears throat> so last year on the team, Josh and I were working to test out a new ejection method for rockets. And ejection is a very important part of um, a rocket's, you know, traveling into the air and then coming back down. And it's when the parachute is actually ejected from the, the body of the rocket in order to slow it on its descent. <clears throat> now, typically, this is a pretty violent event uh, involving pyrotechnics, and you've got a lot of reaction forces that are involved in it because you're traveling really, really fast, and then suddenly you're no longer aerodynamic because you're split in half. And um, you, use, you typically, you would use a small explosion to do this. And uh, that brings us to where we were doing last year. Uh, can you can you move the the slide one forward, Josh? Appreciate it. Um, so last year we were testing out a new type of ejection method that used CO two instead of black powder, uh, because <clears throat> with CO two you're not going to be subjecting your rocket to that much heat, especially internally and against a fabric parachute. Um, you know, as you can see in the in the picture there, we are not trying to blow up the rocket while it's in flight. We just want to have it safely come back down. So can we get can we get the next slide? Parish. So this is the the CO2 ejection system that we used. It's called the Raptor. <clears throat> and on the left, that's just the whole kit. It comes with all of its different pieces and different sized CO2 cartridges. Uh, and if you look at the the picture on the bottom right, that shows one of the Raptor capsules. And so you've got the, the CO2 tank on the left side and it's screwed into that cylinder and that cylinder has a spring and a, at the end of the spring, you see the, the piece that has the sharp end on it. And there actually is a small black powder charge that's used in it and the black powder charge sits up against the back of the, the sharp piece. And so whenever it's set off, it uh, shoots the sharp piece up against the CO2 so that all the CO2 can expand. And then that's where you get your expansion of gases and your explosion to pop the, pop the rocket apart. Uh, the top uh, right picture is just two of those systems set inside of a disc. And that's pretty much exactly what our rocket was looking like when we tested it. Could I, could I get the next slide, please, good sir? Oh, that's it. All right, awesome. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to just unmute and ask them. 